Did you ever stand naked in front of the mirror and look yourself up and down and wonder, where did it go so wrong? Not asking for a show of hands. When I was, when I was much, much younger, uh, I lived in a boy's flat in Lower Hutt. And uh, it was an old house, and the bathroom in the house was quite small and dark, and there was a really small mirror above a really small basin. But when you had a shower and you had a hot shower, like there was fog in the room so thick you could cut it with a knife. Uh, but what that meant was that the really small mirror in the bathroom got really fogged up, and some mornings before work, I'm like trying to wipe it because I'm really worried I'm actually going to shave my nose off my face because I can't see in the mirror. The house we live in now, in the bathroom, we have this massive mirror. And it's got built-in heat pads behind the mirror, which means we never have condensation. And around the edge of the mirror is this massive LED light. And when that sucker turns on, you can't hide anything. All is revealed. And what I want to propose to you this morning is that God's revealing light has its purpose. There is a light coming that is so bright that nothing will be hidden. Our invitation is to prepare ourselves. Before you get embarrassed, before you start getting triggered, before you start thinking this is all about body shaming, because it's not. I just want to start by saying God loves you the way you are. God doesn't make mistakes. God makes masterpieces. You need to hear me. If there's a voice of self-judging, there's a voice of self-loathing, it's not God and it's not me. So let's shut down the accuser right at the start because what we're about to get into, he's got every opportunity to pull you to pieces and I don't want that. I would also say this, that the whole point of standing naked before God is allow him to do something on the inside. God's not a panel beater. Some of you lost that one. Okay. Consider this thought. Let's, let's shift gears. Consider this thought. What if the goal of coming face to face with God was that we would truly know ourselves as God knows us? What if God wants you actually to stand naked before his bright light? Everything exposed. The day you were born, but naked before God. So that you see what he sees, but you see his redeeming work. Not comfortable. <laughs> Maybe not pretty, but perfect. God's always at work, and I want to talk about that today because there's a whole bunch of stuff that he's doing. So, the title of today's message, not surprisingly, is Naked Before God. Unashamedly, the title of today's message is Naked Before God. And, and I want us to, to get into the text because I want us to understand that God is inviting us into a place that he would reveal things that we think are actually hidden, but are not hidden to him. And that would be real before him. And that when we're real before him, he gets to do the work he's always wanted to do in your life, but you just never let him. Sometimes you just have to strip off. So today I want to look at David. Bible scholars in the room would have worked out this already. Naked before God, let's look at David. But I promise you, no dancing. Not going to be naked before the people. Everybody leaving their clothes on, Richard Titty. Okay. <laughs> if you want to know that story, come and see me later. Actually, can you stand? We have, a, we, have a, we have a discipline here 
uh, that I wanted to honor at the start, and you're going to have to stand for a minute because I want to read to you Psalm 51. This is, this is the point of today, Psalm 51. Allow me to read it to you, and you're honoring the word by standing that the word would read you. David writes this, have mercy on me, O God. There you go. Elohim Hasidi. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify, can you, I can see myself in this. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just, for I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify my sins, and I'll be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You've broken me. Every time I read this. Let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. I can't see. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God. You, God, who saves me, then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look with favor on Zion and help her rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. And bulls again will be sacrificed on your altar. Almighty God, we commit ourselves afresh to you here in this moment. We thank you for your word. And I ask, Lord God, that as we unpack this, that you would continue the deep work in each of us that you long to do. Create, us, create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Amen. You may be seated. Every time I read that, it gets me. What, what's going on? Why does David write that? Why does David pour out his heart like that? It's like his prayer journal that he publishes for everyone to read. I mean, would you publish your prayer journal? <laughs> yeah. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, we're going we're gonna to end up there in a second. But what's been going on in the life of David is he's had an oopsie. He's, he's, he spied a beautiful lady across from the roof of his house, having a bath on the roof of another house, and he's taken her to his bed. It's just that she's another man's wife. To make things even a little bit more complicated, she falls pregnant to David while her husband is away at war, and David tries a few tricks but can't make it hidden. And everyone's going to know that it's not Uriah's baby, it's someone else's baby that Bathsheba is carrying. So he does the only thing he can work out to do is he arranges a scheme and the man at the war place, place of war, is killed. Uriah dies. And, uh, and uh, I don't know what he was thinking if he thought that was going to work it out for good, but it didn't. Because we're going to go to the story, which is in 2 Samuel 11. I just want to read to you the last verse of 2 Samuel 11. You can read the whole story for yourself. It would be a uh, great reading for you and the kids at lunchtime, I'm sure. But um, when the period of mourning was over, so the man's dead. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for Bathsheba and brought her to the palace. 
and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. And if you've got notes in your Bible, you'll see that it points to Psalm 51. This is what David wrote as the fruit of this season of his life. I wanted to start with the fruit, and then I want to show you the process. Okay? The fruit of David's experience is Psalm 51. The process is 2 Samuel chapter 12. So we move to 2 Samuel chapter 12. The Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David the story. I love the Bible. You need to read the Bible like you're watching Netflix. Because it's got, it's got cheese, it's got laughter, it's got scandal, it's got murder. Who needs TV? No one. Nathan the prophet tells David the story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he'd bought and raised it up and grew it with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of the rich man killing an animal from his own flock, he took the poor man's only lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vows any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Drum roll, please. David says to Nathan, no, Nathan says to David, <laughs> dude, you're the guy. You're the guy. The Lord says, I anointed you king and I saved you. And you took the man's wife for yourself. Confrontation. So, 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 so here's the thing. Here's the thing. We read the story in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and, and I don't know, maybe it's just my confession today, but I see myself in this story. This is not a confession of adultery. <laughs> this is not me running out to kill someone I'm not happy with. This is me saying I can find myself in this story, and I wonder if you can too. See, one of the things I've learned uh, is that, and I say this to my elders often uh, as a warning, but at the best moment of my week, I'm one decision away from stupid. Doesn't take much for me to turn half a degree and I'm off track. Why? Because I'm like David. Maybe you're more like him than you think. I'm stupid and I do the best I can to prevent errors in my life. I put up boundaries. I have fences in place. I have accountability like you wouldn't believe because... There's too much at stake for me to be one move from stupid and to do something like this. So one of the reasons I want to talk about this is that the better way to do things is actually take the mask off and allow God to do the work in your life first so you don't make the mistake that hurts a nation. What I love about this story is you're going to see is that um, after Nathan comes he rebukes the king. And it's not a main point, but it's a good point, is sometimes God uses other people to point out you're stupid. You'd, be, you, you'd do well to listen. And I, for one, know that. <laughs> There's certain people I'm looking at in this room that, that help me on this journey, that speak to me, that highlight things. It's why I submit myself to eldership. It's why I submit myself to my accountability, my overseeing minister. It's why I submit myself externally to a supervisor. Why? Because I have to have people speaking into my life because they see things I don't see. Friend, you've got a blind spot. But what does David do? Verse 13. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. David confesses to Nathan. I have sinned against the Lord. What I like about this is David doesn't argue. David doesn't defend. David doesn't lobby. You know what? I reckon Western Christians are the best people in the world at the tactic of diversion. We say, yeah, but, or what about, or didn't you not know? David doesn't. He goes, yep, I own it. It's me. 
I did it. He confesses his sin, and I think that's what opens him up for the work that God's about to do that you read in Psalm 51. I've sinned against God. As you'll read in the story, if you have a look down the story, you're going to see that David fasted, which means he denied his flesh, which is really ironic because it was his flesh that got him in this trouble in the first place. See the irony in the story. But he's fasting. He's praying. He petitions. He prays, God, if it would be your will, will you save this baby from death? He's willing to put himself in the place of prayer. He puts himself into sackcloth. He makes himself of no status. As the king, he makes himself nothing. And he sits in sackcloth and says, God, if only you would come. He's showing his remorse. He's showing his repentance. We don't need to rip our clothes and put ashes on our head, but we could certainly check our attitude. Speaking to myself. And then when the baby does die, read the story, the baby dead, boom, gone. Dies as God said. This is what I like about that, not the baby dying, but the David says, well, God be God, let no man change him. God is sovereign. He is above all, including your prayers. And what he chooses, he chooses. David accepts God be God. And I think that is sometimes something that will help us get through circumstances. So the gift that flows out of the story, and you can read it for yourself at, at your leisure, the gift that flows out of the story is, is, is Psalm 51. It's, it's the manuscript that we would look at to pray. It's the, it's the heart of David where he shows us what's going on. And the one little aspect, oh, every, like you can see, every time I read this, it, it cuts me. It messes with me. It becomes a revelation of me because I've, I'm living this as someone who wants their life to be open before God. But all I want to point you to is verse 17. Verse 17. You can see it on the screen if you haven't got a Bible. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. God, you will not reject a broken and repentant heart. You see, I think what God wants is way more than just our attention. Focus is good, by the way, but he wants more than that. I mean, God wants more than our good behavior or our disciplines. Hey, I got up early and I had my quiet time or I, I read my devotional for the day, seven days in a row, and I got a badge on my Bible app. I feel good about that. I mean, that's important. But it's not the highest priority. And this, this says even more than sacrifice. And I have studied this, and, the, and the scholars are saying, it's not despising the sacrifice you're supposed to make. You're supposed to make the sacrifice. But more than that, God wants something. More than that, he wants a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart. Oh, God, why would he say that? Is God brutal, grumpy, just looking at your life, waiting for you to suffer so he can rub his evil little hands together and go, ha, ha, ha? That's not God. Is God up there trying to control you so that you don't have the fruit of your own free will. Not his intention. Read the book of Genesis. So what's God doing? Is it perhaps it's God that God gets upset when we're not perfect? No, that's not God. So what's God doing? God, God actually wants us to live our lives and trip over our own feet to make the mistakes that we're prone to make. Why? All he wants you is to come before him naked. Vulnerable, open, not wearing a mask. Go back, to the, <laughs> go back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve made a mistake. They had free choice and they made the wrong one. What's the first thing they do? Cover themselves. Why? Shame. What's the first thing we do when we make a mistake? Cover ourselves. Wear a mask. Why? Shame. Or if we hide it, no one will see it. But more importantly, I don't have to show it to God. And how did that work out? God wants us to come before him for two simple reasons. One, that we would know him as God. And not your version, his version. And secondly, that we'd begin to see ourselves as, we, as he's already seeing us. It's not, it's not trickery. 
It's just his heart because he knows his heart is that you would truly understand the journey that he's got you on. And this is not a new message. I've been speaking a lot about this this year, 2024, the year of double blessing, but the year where the double blessing looks different than you thought. But we start talking about this in 2020, friends. We start talking about consecration. Consecration is the setting of myself apart so that God would make me holy and pure for his benefit and for his purpose. We taught a series called Embracing Holiness. You find it on the YouTube channel where we just dove into the text to understand why does God want us holy and what is it going to take? Last year, we spoke a season about a season of crossing over and the, the, the preparation that God had to do. And I, we offered to do the circumcision, but God said it wasn't necessary. And then this year, in an encounter night, we unpacked Isaiah 6. Isaiah comes into the throne room of God. What is that? An invitation for intimacy. What's beyond the invitation for intimacy? The invitation to holiness. And why would God want you holy? Because there's an invitation for you to do something. God's kind of preparing us. And what makes me frustrated, and I'll be really honest, is people just don't turn up to the preparation. They miss the lesson, or they turn themselves away from what God's doing. I'm not talking about church attendance. I'm talking about devotion to the journey. God's got me on the journey, and I've been asked by God to be open about it, so I've started podcasting it once a week. There's a podcast called Coffee with Phil. It's on our YouTube. It's on our website. We send it out. Um, It's on Spotify. And I'm just opening up each week about what God's saying to me and what God's doing in me for 30 minutes. So this is real for me, friends. And if you want to find out what's going on in my life, grab a coffee and, and have coffee with Phil. But what I don't want, here's the thing. As, the, as, as a leader in God's church, I'm accountable for what I do and what I say, but I'm not accountable for how you respond. If you don't turn up, you might die in the desert. Don't be that generation. Seriously, I, I, like I'm, I'm getting my dad voice on because it's actually the consequence of you not showing up to the work God wants you to do means you're going to miss out on what he's doing next. And there's a whole generation buried in the, <laughs> the Egyptian desert, the Sinai Desert, as proof of that. So take it as a warning. But take it as an invitation because our job is to lead you. And I want to point to this. As, a, as an eldership, We've committed to a a significant process called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. This is a discipleship program. This is the book um, that's part of the program. Peter Scazzero has been taking us through this. And and look at this. It's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And there's eight lessons in this. And we did this last year as a pilot, and it went really, really well. We're in the middle of doing group number two, and it's kind of going okay, I think. I'm doing it for the third time because I'm slow uh, at learning, and I like to deeply integrate things. But the point is, this is part of the preparation that we're doing. And it's not about a program. Richard and I sat in a coaching call with one of the supervisors um, for Australasia, and he said, okay, just just so I know how to help you guys, I, I just need to know one thing. As eldership, are you completing a program or are you trying to shift the culture of your church? And we're like, oh, 100%. We're trying to change the culture of the church. He says, great, we'll buckle in. It's a seven-year journey, which I wasn't so happy about. (laughs) I wasn't happy about the time frame. I'm happy about the outcome. And I say that to confess to you that we're committed to this for the long term and we're going to go round and round this mulberry bush. Why? Because this is a program that helps open up our hearts for what God wants to do. And it's one of many mechanisms. It's not the only one. It's just the one we've chosen. What I love about the story of David that I pointed you to this morning is an example of this, but it's an example of someone that didn't run away from the confrontation or the opportunity. In week number four, which we completed a while ago, week number four, there's a chapter called Journey Through the Wall. And Peter Scazzaro, the author, he talks about the wall being that moment in your life. Actually, I call it one of those moments because I've got many I'll tell you about. Um, but, But the wall is one of those moments in your life that God orchestrates as an opportunity for him to come and do work that he wants to do. You've got to decide if you're going to say yes or no. Some people bounce off that wall and go backwards. 
The Bible is full of examples of people who had to journey through the wall. Think about Abraham. He was asked by God to take his son, his only son, the son of promise, up the mountain to sacrifice him. If you're a parent, that's one of those moments. Am I willing to give him to God and not my own desires? What about Joseph in the pit or in prison? Faced a moment, one of those moments where God was doing something in him. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But not my will, but yours. As I've said to you, I've had many of these moments in my life. Many walls I bounce into and then got to work out, am I going to go through it or am I going to reject it? Kathy and I, very, very early in our marriage, we had one of those moments where we had two miscarriages. And we were immature, we were newly married, and we had no grid to process. We had to grow up. We had to learn to lean on God as a newly married couple. We had to learn to rely on each other to get through it because we weren't the enemy of each other in that situation. The global financial crisis of 2008, I had what I call one of those moments where I literally fell off my donkey. The Lord said, this is your Saul to Paul conversion. And I felt like I fell off my donkey, whacked my head, and I couldn't see which way I was supposed to go. And the Lord said to me, I'm repurposing you. No longer will you be Saul. You will now be Paul. And ultimately, that was 2008. So that led me on the journey when I came to Te Amuda in 2015. 2020, I hit a wall. We had uh, 2020, not only we had COVID, that wasn't the worst problem I faced. But my entire staff for church that I'd spent five years building quit. In three months, we had five worship leaders leave the church. What was worse than that was one person stood up a meeting, pointed a finger and said, well, you're the only one left. You must be the cause of the problem. I hit a wall that day. Now, how do I choose to respond to that? Psalm 51. So it's real, friends. And I bet you're now thinking, where's my wall? What's my moment in my life? So shut your eyes and ask God to show you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything with it right now. I'm asking you to connect with the journey. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to bring to memory for each person here a moment in their journey, just one of them, or you might get flooded with them. But but Lord, help us to connect with this. Is there a moment in my life where I've had to journey past a wall that was a moment of, of, of potential transformation? And Lord, help us to see it with your eyes. eh? Hold it. Hold it. Hold that memory, friends. Hold it as we keep moving. There's a a mystical poet from the 16th century called St. John of the Cross. He wrote about this season in his life. He called it the dark night of my soul. And it's, it's hard reading. I, I, I must confess I haven't got all my way through it. But, but he, he says in that, you can read the quote on the screen, receive God's gift of the dark night of the soul. This is the ordinary way we grow in Christ. He's like, this is, this is it. This is, the, this is discipleship. So we've got to learn not to look at these as negative experiences. We've got to learn to look at these as not things to be avoided, but things to be walking through them. Treat them like St. John up here says, treat them as a gift from God and seek the beauty and the mystery of God in the mess that you're in. You'll find God in that mess. So one question I've learned to ask is, God, what are you trying to show me or teach me in this moment? It's a better prayer than why God. Why God doesn't usually get answers. But God, what are you teaching me? What are you showing me? And that's precisely why I wanted to bring you to Psalm 51, where God says the sacrifice, David says about God, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. And, and, and I urge you to make Psalm 51 your devotion this week. Just make it your prayer. Like, just pray one verse and see what God does. Just, just open yourself up for, and say, God, I was born a sinner. Verse 5, the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty and you're teaching me wisdom. Make that your prayer. But most importantly, don't run away from the wall. Don't run away. Because to run away is to avoid God's work. Um, In a sermon not that long ago, but they'll 
they all run together for me. Uh, I talked to you about the animal response that goes on in your brain. The animal response that goes in your brain, in the amygdala, in the center of your brain, when you are confronted with something. It's called fight or flight reaction. And it's a chemical reaction, it's hormone based, and it's inbuilt in the human DNA. Now, when you were confronted by a saber toothed tiger in the Ice Age, that's kind of helpful. But when you've got a problem with a flat battery on your phone, you're not supposed to run away from that problem. We've kind of dumbed it down in the Western world. But here's the thing. We take that reaction that goes on in our brain and we think we can apply it to God's invitation to transformation. Common response is, no, God, I'm not ready. Well, God says, I'm only doing this because you are ready. God's a gentleman. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he leads you to these moments that he has already prepared you for. There's an author, his name's Gerald, I can't pronounce his surname. He writes about this book. uh, That he wrote he wrote this book about grace, and he wrote it because his mother, his wife, and his daughter all died in a car accident in the same moment. That's a war. And he writes about it in this book, and he reflects on this, and he says, I chose not to run from my loss, but to walk directly into the darkness, letting the experience of that overwhelming tragedy transform my life. Listen to this insight. Listen closely. He learned that the quickest way to reach the sun and the light of day is not to run west chasing after it, but to turn and head east into the darkness until you finally reach the sunrise. Friends, embrace the dark night of your soul, because if you walk through it, you will find the light. So, if you run away, you will remain in infancy. If you run away, you will remain in immaturity. If you run away, you will remain in ignorance. But did you know, I mean, all those seem obvious, but did you know if you run away, you remain in isolation? Because you're running away from the very people God gave you to find your healing. Because we were saying here, healing happens in community, not in isolation. So not only are you running away from God, you're running away from the people God gave you. But you won't be lonely, because what happens is when people run away from God, they usually find another crowd. And it's a crowd that encourages them in their infancy. It's a crowd that reinforces their immaturity. And it's a crowd that keeps them away from the best life God's got for them. But you're isolated from the best life that God has for you. Think about it that way. So why would you choose to embrace the wall? Because God wants you to know him as God. God truly wants you to come to the place where you know him as God. But more than that, if you embrace this moment, if you embrace this opportunity, if you embrace this orchestrated opportunity that God has prepared, then you will see yourself as he sees you. And and what I want to finish with um, is a couple of things that Jesus says. Because there are there's wisdom in the words of Jesus. So let me, let me just point to this, and then we're going to have an encounter moment because we're set up for one by the text. In the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus begins the Beatitudes with the words on the screen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Did you know that when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's using exactly the same concept that David wrote about in Psalm 51, verse 15. The broken spirit, the contrite, the poor in heart. Jesus uses a phrase, poor in spirit, to say the same thing. But the Amplified Bible expands on it. It says, not just blessed, you know, the Amplified likes to just spell it out, eh, Jan? Make it easy for us. Happy, to be envied, spiritually prosperous, with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of outward conditions. That's what it means to be blessed. So blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble, those who rate themselves insignificant. For theirs is the kingdom 
of heaven. And what I think Jesus is saying in this verse is, guys, this is the way disciples are supposed to live. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is the way you're supposed to live. And we avoid it. I really love the way Matthew Henry makes a comment about this. When speaking about the poor in spirit, he says to be poor in spirit is to thirst after a redeemer. Are you thirsting after a redeemer? I'm reminded of the words of Jesus. Come to me, all who are thirsty. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus at the well. Those who drink of the cup I have will never run dry or be thirsty. So what's he saying? Poor in spirit is the key to thirst after him. So maybe we should be poor in spirit. Hmm. What are the benefits of being poor in spirit? I'm trying to sell it to you. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a great, great, great sales pitch, but there are outcomes that we see in spiritually mature people. Spiritually more pe- mature people, we, we <laughs> they, <laughs> they would accept their brokenness as it is. Not trying to hide it. Someone who's spiritually mature that allow God to do his work will learn to appreciate the holy mystery of God. Some of us went up to our Acts Church gathering on Thursday night to hear Danny G, and he spoke about the tragedy of his 39-year-old son being struck by lightning while ministering and dying. And he says, you know what? I've learned to shrug my shoulders and say, I don't have an answer to that question. But God is still God. That's an appreciation of the holy mystery of God that can't be explained. That's the sign of being mature. People who are spiritually mature open to waiting for God to do his work. And his timing, in my experience, his timing is never as quick as I'd like it to be. And finally, you'll see on the screen there, they detach themselves from false truth that has been guiding them. That means it's what God says is true, not what I think or what I say. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Just a little theology reminder, what's the kingdom of God? The dominion of the king, the rule and reign of the king, the authority of the king, the empowerment of the king. Who's the king? King Jesus. So blessed, happy, envious, spiritually mature, spiritually prosperous are those who are poor in spirit, who are contrite, broken in heart, not worried about the life, because they inherit the rule and reign of Jesus in their life. And I'm a Bible geek, so I went and read the commentary on this. Listen to this. They are happy because theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the present inward kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, as well as the eternal kingdom if they endure to the end. Yikes. The knowledge which they have of themselves and their humiliation of soul before God prepare them for the reception of Christ to dwell and reign in their hearts and all the other blessings of the gospel, of grace and glory. You know what I think this is? This is the reality of Jesus he's inviting us into. This is life as it's designed to be by him. And yet so many Christians run away from it, avoid it, don't prioritize it, fill their life with other stuff and don't make worshiping him the priority of their lives. I want to finish with one more, one more scripture. And it's why Kathy started our gathering from Revelation chapter 3, but I want to read the words prior to it. These are the words of Jesus to you. These are the words of Jesus to the church. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see correctly. I correct and discipline everyone 
I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. I'm going to finish with a song that I chose because I, I feel like it's a moment of encounter for you. It's not a song you have to sing because it's not a song you know. But it's a song where they'll sing something over you that's going to be a bit of an impartation. They're going to say words that you might want to have on your lips. And so we're just going to play the song. You can stay seated. You can read the screen because the words are on the screen if you want. You can close your eyes and listen to the words and try and internalize them. But friends, this is your moment of encounter. This is your invitation where you get to come face to face with God. No mask, no hiding, just before his glorious light. And what he desires is that you reveal your brokenness to him because he's in the business of fixing broken. We believe here in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We believe that if you're encountering the Holy Spirit where you are, it's because he wants to touch you and transform you. If you want help in that, touch the person next to you and ask them or come and find me up the front here. But we absolutely have every confidence in the power of the work of Jesus administered through his Holy Spirit. So let's play that song, and I invite you to enjoy it.